Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Blitz session. Uh, Jim Miller is president of Town Bank Mortgage, and uh, he did a, an economic outlook in December, which was very popular with the group. So we decided to bring him back. So welcome, Jim. I, if we're the only thing between you and and checking out that that rolling uh, real estate, then I think we'll let you get started. So please, thank you very much for being here. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. And I, I am happy to be with you all this morning. So we did last talk back in December, and, and a lot has happened since then. Probably most importantly, we've had some weakness showing up in the economy, including several bank failures here recently, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. This has made the Federal Reserve at least stop to consider if it's raising short-term interest rates from zero to 5% since the beginning of 2022 has indeed supplied the desired break on what seemed to be an overheated economy with inflation that we haven't seen in 40 years. So rolled over here to Fred. Uh, for those of you who did participate in our last discussion, you may remember we had a little fun with him. He was the Basset Hound in the movie Smoking a Bandit. And I, instead of talking about Fred, because you'll hear me refer to Fred here throughout our presentation, I was actually talking about the large economic data warehouse managed by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and that's called the Federal Reserve Economic Database, or FRED for short. You all can consult that uh, database at any time. It's, it's very powerful and, frankly, uh, very user-friendly and a lot of information out there that you might find of interest, so I encourage you to check that out. Next slide, please. So Fred meets Clyde. So Fred the Basset Hound's modern day counterpart I just have is uh, Clyde. He's my daughter's spoiled rotten Basset, and he is definitely more carefree than the old Fred was. Of course, Fred had the turbulent times of the 1970s to worry about. Hopefully we will soon return to a little more friendly housing environment than we've been experiencing here in the last 15 months, maybe more in keeping with Clyde's easygoing manner. Next slide. So let's first turn our attention to some statistics coming out of NAR. The latest data from them shows that existing home sales are running at an annualized rate of just short of 4.6 million, and that was captured in February. The good news was that was up 14.5% from the prior month. The not so good news was it was down 22% from the prior year. Unsold inventory sits at a 2.6 month supply. And uh, at the current sales pace, that's uh, about a 1.7 month supply. And that's down about 10% from where it was in January. Median. Home sale price is uh, $363,000 as of Jan uh, February, excuse me, which was a little bit off from where it was in January of 22. Uh, this, by the way, ends the streak of 131 consecutive months where the year over year comparison, in other words, February 23 versus February 22, declined. So that may be a sign of things to come. and. You know, that might be a sign of a little bit of loosening for, for more supply. We'll see. Um, homes for sale inventory. There's a lot of information conveyed in this graph. Existing home sales available for sale in February were 1.137 million units versus a little over 900,000 a year ago. The average for 2000 through 2019 was just under two and a half million uh, existing homes for sale. So less than half of what that average was for that period of time. So we're definitely in a constrained environment and it's pretty easy to see when you look at this, this graph. There were also 436,000 new homes available for sale in February. And that was up a little bit from just under 400,000 a year earlier. And the average from 2000 through 2019 of new homes for sale was 310,000 units. So we've actually had little progress on that front. Not enough 
and when you think about those numbers, it's up about a hundred thousand over the average, not enough to overcome the overall change in the picture. As you can see, we're well down from where we were back um, from say 2013 to to before the pandemic. Um, and we do we have a question. Okay. Are you saying new homes, as in new construction? New homes. New construction. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. So the the orange portion there in the graph is the new homes, and the blue is the existing. So existing homes still are the lion's share of all home sales occurring, but actually you can see there are there's a, a greater share of new homes now available for sale, and that's interesting. Um, there's been a little flip there where inventory for new homes has grown in the last few months as builders have basically picked up some of the pace. They've gotten through the pandemic era backlogs and the rate of completions has picked up. So they now account for about 28% of all homes for sale. And prior to the pandemic from 2000 to 2019, they were only 11%. And you can see that bar gets kind of skinny back in that time frame. Uh, the shortage of less expensive starter homes is still problematic. That's not really showing up here in this graph, but it's uh, it's a challenge for first time home buyers. I don't think I'm telling you all anything you don't know, but that's part of the equation that's you know just causing some angst out there. Let's go to the next screen, please. Home affordability, uh, the good segue, right? All right, so. Um, Let's, I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole or a uh, tangent. Uh, we've had these two bank failures last month that sent a shutter through the markets. And the impact upon the market from these failures is that banks are more closely monitoring their liquidity risk. And there's been a pullback in lending activity as a result. It's a, uh, I noticed the, the statistic was in the last uh, 30 days, bank loan output is down three and a half percent from where it was going. So that could end up having an adverse effect on smaller builders if construction loans become less plentiful. So we'll have to see how that works out. Let me talk a little bit more about those bank failures just to, because I feel it's my civic responsibility, I guess. So. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were two of the biggest bank failures in U.S. history. Silicon Valley Bank was not due to bad credit, which is the first of its kind in over 100 years. They instead had a mismatch between deposits, which could be withdrawn at any time, funding long-term bonds that they had purchased, and their clientele, which was mainly tech and crypto companies, needed cash with a downturn in their business. So they were caught short in regard to their funding ability when people started demanding some of those deposits. Signature was more typical to more uh, bank failures. When, uh, when they went, they had bad loans that, that were uh, mainly, again, to that same clientele base of, of tech and crypto companies and they didn't have the capital to withstand those losses from those bad loans. Both these banks were a reflection of their clientele's risk profile, and they didn't anticipate the volatility from these tech companies hitting all at once like they did. So I was surprised at the apparent lack of regulatory oversight for both of these banks. Maybe we'll learn more about that in time. And by the way, it is important to note that the cost of these failures is funded by the FDIC, which is effectively the bank's insurance company. Banks pay premiums for their deposit insurance, just like homeowners or consumers do for homeowners insurance. These losses, and for that matter, any bank failure, are paid for by the banks, not the taxpayers. So that's an important note, I think. All right, getting back to the home affordability for a moment. If mortgage rates were to fall below 6%, home affordability still remains highly constrained. You can see on the chart here just where we are relative to where we've been in the past in regard to the, the home affordability index. And it's 
it's up there at back in October when rates had peaked, it was at an all time high. And you can see it's fallen a little bit further here in March. And again, if we see further rate decreases, we'll trend downward, hopefully more where we were back in 2020. But we got a ways to go. So if we're below 6%, that's a start, but it's still think about where rates were back in 2020 in the twos and threes and home prices weren't as high as they were either. So that's the, the two pronged or one, two punch, however you want to phrase it, that is causing the issue here. And all, and speaking of the rates back in 2020 and 2021, we've got basically a lock in effect where existing homeowners are hesitant to give up their low mortgage rates to sell to ease the inventory supply because they're they've got a very low interest rate on their current mortgage. So as mortgage rates decline, maybe we'll see a little bit of relief there. And you notice I said, as they decline, um, that's a kind of a segue into, in a few minutes anyway, we'll be talking about where I think the direction of rates are going. And as you might imagine, I just gave it away. I think they are going to decline. All right, let's roll now, over the next can we? I don't think we want you to say that. Nope. But that's what you think, really. You think they're going to climb? De decline. Oh, I oh. thought you said climb. Goodness. No. Okay, good. No. I'll... <laughs> Glad you asked. I didn't want anybody to think that. No. All right. No. Decline or fall or, or decrease. I'll, I'll be more careful with my words and enunciation. All right. Over on the following page is a, a look at changes in CPI. This is a monthly chart showing the change from month to month in uh, the cost of living index. So this goes back to the 1960s. We've been through the worst inflation in 40 years. You can see toward the right hand side of the chart there when it spikes up toward that red line. Last summer's peak hasn't been seen since back in the late in the early 80s or mid 70s. Um, and you can see that yellow line basically from 1984 through 2021, we averaged about a quarter of a percent on a monthly change in CPI for that period. So you can see we're well above trend at this point. If you ask 10 economists about what inflation is going to do, you're probably going to get 10 different answers. Roll over to the next slide. You can see this chart shows the annual change in CPI. And again, I got that red line there showing how it spiked back in 1980-81. And we haven't seen anything like it until here recently. And this kind of explains why the Fed has been so aggressive in raising rates, because they want to attack inflation before it truly takes root like it did back in the late 70s, early 80s. because um, when I say it takes root, it's the expect expectation about inflation, people's outlook in regard to inflation, that is the hardest thing to change. And if basically you've got to go through something when you've got real high interest rate, or excuse me, inflation, you've got to go through something like we did back in 1981 of absolutely stamping it out of the system to make people's mindset change. So that's why the Fed has been so aggressive in raising rates like they have. Um, I am hopeful that they will take a wait and see here shortly because they've moved it a lot. It went from, again, zero to five percent already since the last, beginning of last year. And the yellow bar here is showing us that, again, from 1984 through 2021, we had approximately a two and a half percent average inflation rate for all that time well less than what we've been experiencing here recently. I do think that inflation is going to continue to fall. It's, it, again, it peaked last summer, although it won't happen in an orderly way like the Fed would like. Um, still, we do know that it peaked, the headline inflation peaked last summer at, depends on your, your uh, I guess, definition, but approximately 9%. And uh, that was, 6.6% above, or 6.7 even, above what the Fed is looking for for a target rate of approximately 2%. And 
basically the reason that I think and, and a lot of people think that it's going to continue to decline is that calculation is based on an aggregation of your month over month changes and a lot of high month over month changes have already fallen off and there's more still in line to continue to fall off as the months roll forward and, and basically last you know last april's number is going to fall off when we know what this april's number is and it's likely to be probably somewhere between two and 0.2 and 0.4 percent and the number falling off i believe is 0.8 so it's a pretty significant change we're going to see there and the prediction is that cpi will be less than the annual change in cpi will be less than four percent by june so you know it, it touched nine it's currently at five and again i think you're going to see it continue to, to fall uh, throughout the, the rest of this year and into next uh, certainly we're seeing the core goods inflation of, if anybody noticed the producer price index actually declined last month and that was a surprise to the market but that's another good sign that core goods inflation is well under control and interestingly enough energy prices which basically started this whole mess um, have been declining and that's even though OPEC had announced that they were going to cut back on their oil production so it'd be interesting to see whether people drive a little less or for that matter maybe we just don't see the increase in in gasoline prices although again i think that would be based on a reduced demand and again i think there is a little bit of that going on where people just aren't driving as much and using as much gasoline as they've used in the past uh, so cpi like i said probably down to 4% by June or July and lower in 2024. We do still expect the yield curve to be inverted through 2024. We'll talk about that a little later. All right, thank you, Ashley. So let's talk about 10 year treasury yields. I almost forgot, by the way, that the last couple of slides have been courtesy of Fred. So this is kind of the thing that you would be seeing if you did go out and visit that website. This chart shows that generally speaking, the 10 year Treasury's yield has fallen since that time back in 1981 when the Fed effectively crushed inflation. And yeah, that's a pretty hard argument to go against if you look at that green trend line from 1983 or four, three, I guess, to 2021. However, since then, and by the way, it bottomed out at 0.52%. So just about half a percent yield and you can see it was actually back at 16 percent back in 1981 so a uh, pretty significant change over the years anyway since then the 10-year yield climbed and it actually hit four and a quarter percent in uh, late october last year when the market finally seemed to realize that inflation had peaked in june and we started to see some relief there and it's been a little bit of a bumpy ride and we'll talk about that more in a moment but nevertheless it does that that current run-up seems to have peaked and uh now hopefully we'll see it uh, turn the other direction the 10-year treasury yield is largely driven by inflation rates and expectations and that's why we're looking at it here after we've just talked about cpi next slide please so this is a little bit shorter time period looking at the same information. So this is from 2021 to present. And again, you can see how uh, the 10 year Treasury yield did start climbing when inflation started climbing and back in 2021 peaked late last year. We got what I called our Thanksgiving present there in, in November and rates started coming to our yield started coming down. And again, it's been a little bit of bumpy road. There was a high employment number in the end of January that kind of freaked out the market a little bit, but they figured out that that was sort of a blip. And frankly, I, if anybody had taken the time to read the report, most of the jobs that they were so concerned about being created were in the hospitality industry and uh, nothing against the hospitality industry, but that's not a higher end job that is going to be making a significant paycheck that might spur on inflation. So 
anyway, since then they bounced around and we're currently at about three and a half percent. Next page. All right, so one more look here at the 10 year treasury yields since the 60s. And now let's look at them in re, uh, comparing them to mortgage rates. You can see that chart is shaped very similarly to the 10 year treasury. There's a strong correlation there. Why would that be? You got a 10 year treasury and a 30 year mortgage. Well, you, you may recall me talking about this the last time we got together. Uh, the average life of a mortgage loan is somewhere between six and 10 years, basically depending on what mortgage rates are doing and some other factors. But anyway, as a result, that has been basically the benchmark treasury instrument that is looked at to then base where mortgage rates are going to go. Next slide. So zooming in a little bit like we did with the treasury yields since the beginning of 21. You can see it was a little delayed impact in regard to when mortgage rates started going up about a year actually. Um, not exactly sure why that happened like that, but anyway, uh, when when it finally did take off, it did it with a vengeance rising from 3% to, well, over 7% in uh, October and November last year. It peaked at seven and a quarter percent for a conventional loan. And again, since then it's, it's trended off and that's been welcome. Uh, as I mentioned, we we are see we always see a strong correlation of mortgage rates to the 10 year treasury but there are a couple of other drivers there too and if we enter a recession investors expect that there'll be a higher possibility of default on mortgage loans and therefore it'll cost more to service those loans so that's something that causes mortgage rates and pricing to to differ from being a straight uh, uh, take off on what the 10 year treasury is and proxy was the word I was looking for. And also if uh, rates are going to fall dramatically or the fear is they will, then in investors are concerned about prepayment risk. So that also holds back price appreciation for mortgages and mortgage bonds versus the 10 year treasury. If there is indeed that type of pre prepayment risk. So rolling over to the following page, you can see that we had a, a spread between mortgage rates and the 10-year treasury back in early 22 of one and three quarters percent. And then as rates started rising and more volatility crept into the market and there was more concern about prepayment risk and also default risk that would cause again uh, servicing costs to increase. We saw the spread between mortgage rates and the 10 year treasury rise all the way up to 3%. And they actually even went higher than that at the uh, here recently. So it's oscillating around a little bit now, but it's it's still up there toward 3% and that's way higher than it normally has been. So if there's less volatility in the market, we should see this spread and mortgage rates decline. Next slide. All right, one more closer look at the recent mortgage rates, say for the last 180 days. I mentioned, uh, well, two big ifs. If the 10 year US Treasury yields decline, then we would expect to see mortgage rates follow. If we see the spread between, or excuse me, if we see the drivers that cause that additional spread between the mortgage rates and the 10 year Treasury ease, then we would also expect to see mortgage rates decline. Two big ifs. Now, for probably some of the most important things I'm going to be telling you this morning, it's kind of like a row of dominoes, and it starts with inflation. If the CPI continues to trend downward and the Fed pauses its rate increases after May, the 10 year Treasury is going to decline. And mortgage rates should follow. How much depends on what that spread between mortgage rates and the 10 year is. And again, that's more a function of, in addition to what the 10 year treasury yield itself is doing and inflation is doing, then is the question around, are we gonna have a bad recession that's gonna cause a lot of loan defaults? And also are rates gonna fall very quickly and possibly cause prepayment risk for investors? 
So those are the questions that we've got to be answering. But like I said, it's kind of a domino. Once one starts falling, the others should go with them. All right, hang on one second. We have a question. Uh, Karen, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Do you can you please explain prepayment risk? Are you saying that because the interest rates go down, the people holding the loans are likely to refinance? Yeah. So if if that's exactly it. If if I did take a loan out, well, certainly uh, last November, I was paying probably somewhere in the vicinity of seven percent or more for that mortgage loan. If suddenly we see, see rates quickly fall then many people like me would be looking to refinance, save all of a sudden rates are down in the mid fives. That's a decent savings, particularly on a larger loan. So yes, it's that fear of refinance or selling the house that uh, the investors are scared about, and therefore they aren't willing to pay up for that loan like they normally would. And actually, I'll, I'll take it one step further. When rates went up as high as they did, they're in the 7% range. Investors weren't even willing to pay a par price for those loans. Instead, we had to charge discount points in order to buy rates down for the borrowers to get down to a level that uh, investors were really interested in buying. Because again, they were quite concerned about that prepayment risk on that higher coupon. Tim? Right. John, ahead, uh, Jim, I think you needed to explain what par price means for them. Sure. So when we look to sell a loan to an investor, uh, there's a grid of pricing that they are willing to pay for for the loan. And depending on what the rate is, uh, normally the higher the rate, the more that they would be willing to pay. Par would mean they were willing to pay. If I had a $100,000 loan, they would pay me exactly $100,000 for it. If if the rate was a little higher than that, they might say pay me a 1% premium. So I would actually receive $101,000 for that same loan. Or when we started to see these, these fears of prepayment creep into the market last year, then they might not, e even though it was at a higher rate, they might even say, you know what, I'm afraid that thing's going to prepay in, as soon as rates start going down. I'm not even willing to pay you for the face value of the loan. I'm only willing to pay you $99,000 for that same loan. So and, it's- and, look, can I inter and what that means for your clients is that if they're only gonna pay us $99,000 for a $100,000 loan, that means we have to charge your clients that one point. So that means we, when we when we can't get get a par price, we have to pass that that charge on to the borrower. So when we can't offer your borrowers a zero point rate, that's the reason why they have to make up the difference for what the investor is buying that loan for. Right, and and as you might imagine, the the objective when we make a loan is is for us to turn around and sell it at a profit. So, um, <laughs> that that we are a for profit company, right, Jim? We we certainly are. We try to be. Yeah, and, and I also I also want to go back to what you said a few slides ago about you were talking about the average length of a mortgage is six six years or so. Six to ten, right? Yeah. Six to ten. So when an investor has a loan, they anticipate that those buyers are gonna or those uh, owners are gonna pay on that loan for six to ten years before they either right. refinance it or pay it off. So as as Tim and Jim are alluding to. With the rates high, they're pretty sure that it's it's going to pay off a whole lot sooner than six to ten years, which is they were banking, right. literally banking on that. Right, and, and this Karen, would fall is, under the category of too much information, but still, they have when when they buy a loan, they are they have almost like actuaries. They have charts looking to see how long they think that loan's going to remain with them, and they will amortize the premium that they did pay us over the term of whatever that expected life is. So if it's shorter or very, very short, then they're saying, well, there's little or no time for us to, to write that off. So we just can't pay that much. And that's, that's the driver there. All right, Karen, go ahead, please. Don't the banks make up for it though in volume if they're lowering their interest rates and that unlocks some of these houses that we need to start selling? Well, uh, 
the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of mortgage loans, particularly fixed rate mortgage loans that are made in this country are securitized. They're, they're sold and securitized. Generally, if it's a conventional loan, those are going to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And those loans effectively back the mortgage bonds that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae issue on an ongoing basis. So yeah, uh, I, I understand what you're saying, but that's that's more you you'd be talking more about a, a a company that's making a loan and simply holding on to it, putting it on their balance sheet. So yes, it, there's a very limited amount of that that goes on. It's it's just a, a few percent normally that uh, happens in that regard, and the rest is like I said, generally going into the secondary market and ends up backing those mortgage-backed securities. So there, there. That's that machine just continues to hum. It's, it's really just. Uh, it really doesn't matter what the rate environment is. It's going to continue to to churn like it normally does. Thank you. Sure. All right. So, um, good segue. We're then looking at the Mortgage Bankers Association's forecast for the remainder of this year. They go into 24 as well, but, you know, uh, I, I joke with economists, well, what, what happens if the, your uh, one-year or two-year plan doesn't work out like you want it to? And they say, well, we make it a three-year. So we, don't, we aren't going to go back out there and look any further out. But anyway, here is the projections from the Mortgage Bankers Association from late March. And actually, I think their new projections came out just this morning. I heard they took a tiny bit off of what they expect to be uh, closed in regard to mortgage loans. I think it was like a 1% decline. But anyway, we'll, we'll roll with this. It's not so far off that it makes this totally superfluous. So anyway, interest rates, you can see the 6.4% that they predicted for the first quarter more or less came true. These are, these are averages for the quarters, what they're expecting. Uh, 6.1%. Well, it could happen. We're we're a little bit high on that right now. They've, they've probably been closer to six and a quarter for the so far here in uh, April, but there's still another couple months to play out. So we could see that, and going down all the way to five point three percent as an average for the fourth quarter. Obviously, that would be welcome news. Why do they think that? Well, um, their projection is that the inflation rates are going to come down to less than 4% in the second half of the year. And therefore the 10 year treasury yields will fall. And you can see as far as volume goes, uh, we focus on purchase loans because for one thing, that's the majority of loans being made these days. Refinance loans, as you might imagine, don't appeal to many people because rates are considerably higher than they were back in 2020, 2021 when most loans that are in place were made. Almost two thirds of the loans that are currently in place were closed in 2020, 2021. It was a significant volume time. So anyway, uh, purchase loans are expected to increase about 30% from the first quarter here to the second quarter. And we've seen an increase, not quite that robust. And sure enough, like I said, you. Uh, uh, the word is that the projections that the MBA is updating are going to be somewhat less than what we're seeing here. But anyway, up a good bit here in the second quarter and staying up at that level or even increasing a bit, 4 or 5% for the third and fourth quarters. And again, that is rate driven. Now, the expectation beyond simply being uh, that that's more that that creates more affordability and just a better environment for someone buying a home. It also implies that they think there will be some loosening in regard to somebody with say somebody has a three and a half or four percent mortgage on their current home. If rates are are down in the low fives by the end of the year, that's not nearly as big a difference as somebody looking at a six and a half or seven percent loan like we were late last year and that's that's what they're banking on 
And then home sales. I just wanted to ask, because I know sometimes uh, the mortgage bankers make these projections and they don't necessarily update them. Were they correct for Q1? They were pretty close. OK, good. That, I mean, that's helpful when when you see that they <laughs> they were even yeah. right. Yeah, they were pretty close. There was a, a we we as a company did a little better, but yeah, the industry was off uh, about 15, 16 percent from the fourth quarter to the first quarter. And we like I said, we didn't get hit quite so hard, but we we felt it. And then you see the home sales, uh, existing home sales. Uh, tracking upward as the year goes along and the same thing. I think they're looking at good news on the inflation front, driving interest rates downward. So let's go look at the next page. OK, one more shot at the mortgage rates versus the 10 year Treasury looking back over a, into the 1970s and. Generally speaking, volatile economic conditions are what make that spread increase because uncertainty is bad for loan pricing. Uh, just like, well, any time that there's a concern about uh, what servicing values might be or what prepayment risk might be, or for that matter, is there uh, more concern than normal in regard to what home values might be? You're going to see loan pricing generally going up because the market's going to demand more payment, more premium in order to take on that loan. So you can look back historically, these these uh, times of economic turbulence is when we've seen the spike in the yield in, in the spread between mortgage rates and the 10 year Treasury. By the way, the 10 year Treasury, if you think about it, that's backed by the full faith and and credit of the US government. So that's that's supposed to be the risk free return for a 10 year period of time. And then a premium on top of that is is demanded by the market for going from that safety of the 10 year Treasury to making a mortgage loan. That's that's why that works like that. And again, uh, you can see that blue bar there at one and three quarters being the, the average for this 50 plus year period of time for the spread between the two. And then the question mark up there in regard to where are we headed from here? And hopefully that is downward. All right. So we've talked a little bit, a tiny bit about recessions and the gray bars on all of these screens show the recessions as time has gone along and um, Coming out of every one of the recessions since 1975, we have seen mortgage rates decline. So that is a, a positive for us. It's not in a vacuum as other things to consider, but in, in regard to interest rates themselves, we would expect if we do go into a recession to see mortgage rates decline, excuse me, decrease. All right. so. Generally speaking, the yield curve, the shape of the yield curve is a good indicator that we're heading into a recession. And the yield curve is a collection of yields based on various notes and bonds with different maturity dates, starting on the left hand side, typically where the short term rates or yields are, and then on the right hand side where the long term yields or rates are. This is generally how it's looked at, you're looking at the two year treasury yields versus five seven actually three five seven ten and thirty year treasury instruments and what those yields are and you can see a year ago it was a positive slope in other words as you went along in time there was more return demanded by the market in order to buy a 10-year treasury note versus a two-year treasury note it was what two a little under two and a half percent for a yield for the two year treasury a year ago and 283 for a 10 year treasury. Now, a year later, you see that the short end is higher, and that's because the Federal Reserve has been raising short term rates for the past year. And that's the rate that they control the overnight rate that uh, that banks lend and borrow money 
with each other is what the Federal Reserve directly char uh, controls. And that trickles down through the system in all kinds of different ways. It impacts the prime rate, which is basically what drives commercial loans. And to a degree, it drives what auto loans are and maybe even uh, credit card rates. So it impacts the economy. And the higher that gets, the less borrowing there occurs because people are concerned about affordability on that people and, and companies. And on the shorter end, uh, we're, you can see we're higher than we were a year ago, although let's now roll to the next screen, Ashley. And you can see last December, just a few months ago, there was a much wider spread there. So, uh, and actually, as time's gone on, it's not that the 10-year uh, Treasury yield has come down. It's almost exactly the same as it was in December. But as time, time has gone along, then that one-year look back, uh, rates were, or excuse me, yields were somewhat higher. So, uh, the, you know, the, the shock of what happened in the last year is starting to diminish as time goes along because instead of comparing from 2022 to 2021, now we're looking at 2023 to 2022, and it's kind of baked into things now. So let's go back one to that next slide. There you go. All right. So. The yield curve has gotten flatter, too. Uh, there's only a 50 or 60 basis point difference between the two-year Treasury yield and the 10-year Treasury yield. And now let's move forward again, Ashley. Sorry to give you a vertigo. But all right, it was 80 to 100 basis point difference back um, in December. When that starts to flatten, that is an indication that recession is closer. So. That's typically is a good, good sign. And again, you could you saw that prior slide, how good a predictor inversion of the yield curve is for having a recession. So I, I think there's actually, I'm sorry, it's the next slide. Let's go there, Ashley. Here's yield curve inversions over the last 40 plus years. And you can see the gray bars. So every every time that red line goes below zero, that's a that's a yield curve inversion. The two year Treasury yield is higher than the ten year, and every time it goes below zero, that's saying that that the ten, the short term rates are higher than the long. And the gray bars show the recessions. So you can see, each and every time we've had an inversion, there has been a recession to follow. So the question mark there is when's it going to happen now? And it, I think it is only a matter of time. The longest inversion that we had was, well, back in the 8081 time frame. It went on for several years. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of this one. It was uh, just started last July. So, with that flattening, that's probably as good a sign as any that we are going to have some sort of recession coming at us. Um, and that's a good segue into the next screen. So here's Fed funds expectations. There's basically futures traders out there that basically that's, that's what they're doing. They're they're looking at the probability of rate movements, and the current futures are predicting that we're going to have one more increase in the Fed funds rate. You can see that that uh, here on the top right corner of the chart. Uh, we've gone to five and they think it's going to go up again one more time. And then they're predicting that uh, it will start falling and they're predicting three cuts in the second half of the year. That's these these white lines uh, down below. So. That would imply that we're going to have a recession soon and that the Fed would actually start turning the other way. I'm not sure I'm buying into that. I do think they will take one more quarter percent increase here in May, but then uh, I think they're going to take a wait and see as far as what's going on with the economy. And yeah, at this point, they've built in plenty of room to do rate cuts. They didn't have that prior to all this, and that was one of the reasons they, again, were so aggressive in raising rates because they wanted to be able to react to the favorably to the economy if indeed there were a uh, need to 
spur it on and, and cut rates. But uh, anyway, there's no doubt. I think we're approaching the end of their rate raising efforts. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that inflation seems to have been taken under control and is heading in the right direction. So pretty telling stuff. You know, if we didn't have the, the inventory shortage, I think things would be pretty rosy. Um, and I know that's kind of like saying, well, if we hadn't run out of gas, we could still be driving. But um, lower mortgage rates are the quickest way to relief for this inventory issue. And I, along with the MBA and Fannie Mae, and for that matter, uh, somebody I read fairly often is uh, the fellow who runs uh, J.P. Morgan's, uh, his, their, their chief strategist. And uh, they all think that we're going to continue to see lower inflation and whoops, where did we get that? Well, from me, I just thought that you might want to just do a real quick. This is how a mortgage, okay. how how the secondary market works if if John buys the house. So sure. it, it's a nice little schematic that, that just kind of because you're talking about the secondary market and things. And sometimes uh, a little yes. a little diagram helps a little bit if you don't mind just running over that. Yeah, not at all. All right. So as as I mentioned before, most fixed rate mortgage loans in the country are sold into the secondary market. And that the reason for that is a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, if it played out all the way to the end of its life, and that's, that's a long, long time to have um, that loan in place and trying to fund it is a challenge for most banks. Okay. Because think about it just like, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank found they had bought long-term bonds with deposits that had no maturity to them. They were actually demand deposits. But even if they had been, say, five-year CDs, that doesn't come anywhere near what a 10- or 30-year Treasury bond is is going to, to the, the life of it's going to be, right? Because it's literally two or maybe even six times as long as a, a, a five-year CD. So since they can't effectively fund that loan themselves, they will, they, we will make that loan under the guidelines furnished by basically Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and it will be sold to, to them. And it might have a middleman before it gets there because there are companies that are called aggregators. There are some large banks and some are private uh, non, non-institutional companies that take these loans and basically package them up into backing mortgage-backed securities. And you can see uh, Sarah's diagram here uh, that in the, in the right-hand side, you see all these mortgage loans being pooled or accumulated together to back a security. So to, the mortgage-backed securities are usually uh, in amounts of 10 million or or more. And uh, that's obviously a lot of mortgages going into to, to back those pools. In fact, oftentimes there are 100 million. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're very significantly sized and there could be hundreds or even thousands of loans in that pool of, of loans that back that mortgage-backed security that that eventually are issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then basically the, the, the general public can buy pieces of those securities that, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have created. You may have mortgage-backed securities or a, a, a mutual fund that buys mortgage-backed securities in your 401k, for instance. So anyway, that's that's the circular there. And that, that way, when the bank or a mortgage company makes that loan, sells it to Fannie Mae or an aggregator, they're reimbursed basically for that, the, the funding of that loan, and then can turn around and make another one and another one and another one and another one. So that is the flow that we're talking about there. So if you go uh, clockwise here, uh, John buys his house, 
gets his loan from the bank. The bank puts it into the pool of mortgages to back mortgage-backed securities. That large bank there, or Fannie Mae, it could be either one, um, is going to issue those securities, and individuals or institutions will buy those securities. And that's that's the cycle for a mortgage loan. So anyway, just just thinking a little bit about where we're headed. Uh, if we do get lower, lower mortgage rates, uh, that will be the quickest way for relief in regard to our inventory shortage. I'm not saying that's the long term fix, but nevertheless, lower rates should give a little bit of you want to say lubrication to the, the system to make it move a little more effectively. Because again, if someone's uh, got a 3% mortgage, 3.5% mortgage, and they can now get a mortgage at say in the high fours or low fives, that's a whole lot more palatable than six or 7%. So not, and for that matter, more affordable too. And that's a big deal as well. So if we're going to have a recession, uh, you can certainly argue we've already been one here in our industry, uh, both mortgage and realty, uh, because we've had falling sales, higher mortgage rates. Uh, residential real estate normally leads the economy out of recessions. It's normally one of the first areas to be impacted, and then it's one of the first to come out. So if it actually does mat finally materialize that we do have a recession, it should be an improvement for us because of lower rates, so long as there isn't a significant amount of job losses. And that doesn't seem very likely because we still have so many jobs opened. And while we have seen tech companies doing some layoffs, they had actually overhired in a lot of cases. They're, they're, it's interesting if you read about it, they, they were trying to keep people away from some of their competitors even. It was kind of odd how that was going on back in the, pandemic days. But nevertheless, while they have been laying some people off, it, it pales in comparison to their total uh, population of, of employees and still compared to the, the number of jobs that are open and the people coming onto the workforce, it, it's it's a blip. It's, it's just not really impacting things very much. So you haven't seen the unemployment rate climbing much. Folks don't think it will climb much at all, even if we do quote unquote go into a recession. So I think that we're are, we are headed for uh, somewhat improved conditions over the, the remainder of this year and into next year. It may be more pronounced next year, but nevertheless, I think that we are going to see rate relief and at least a little bit of, of inventory coming on the market as a result. So that's a lot of talk. I hope uh, hope that all resonated with you all. And uh, if you've got any questions, other questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Hopefully, I passed right. Sarah's pop quiz. Yeah, that was very good. Yeah, when I popped up that screen for you to take care of, yeah, I think that's that's uh, it's just such a basic, just kind of gives the the cycle of the of the loan. But I don't see any other questions. Does anybody have any other questions? Super. All right. Well, thank you so much. Jim, all really right. appreciate your time. Thank you all. And all right. enjoy your day. All right. Everybody, Thanks. everybody go out and